My name is Dave Marchik, and I am the director for the Center for Presidential Transition. And today's webinar is our third in a series on tips for aspiring political appointees. And today we're focusing on the important issue of financial disclosure, the whole universe of issues around taxes and conflicts of interest. Uh, we've had, we're very pleased that we've had several hundred people watch each of these seminars. And that shows, I think, just the incredible level of interest in people wanting to serve whomever wins, which is good for the country and good for our government. So we're two weeks away from the election, just 13 days. And you know, our focus at the Center for Presidential Transition is to provide the expertise and support for a smooth and effective presidential transition, regardless of what happens. That's a transition to a second term, should President Trump win, or a transition to a first term, should Vice President Biden win. And what we wanna do is to help you be prepared to serve your government should the candidate that you prefer win, and should that candidate want you to serve in their administration. So we're focused on filling out the forms and being ready because our experience shows that the process is not perfect. So you may be looking for a job, you may want to apply, you may want to be considered, and the process may take a little while, but then as soon as the next administration decides they want you, they'll want your forms to be ready yesterday, and you'll want to get in your seat as soon as possible. So it takes just enormous time to fill out these forms. They're complicated and we would encourage you to get going now, regardless of what happens, so you can be prepared. So um, on slide two, we're joined by four spectacular experts on the presidential appointment process. And they're gonna lead a brief discussion of the agenda you see on your screen. We're gonna go for about 20 to 25 minutes with uh, presentations. And then what we found on these is that the Q&A is fantastic. So um, there's a Q&A option in the Zoom. It's please submit your questions. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So Diana Mullis will begin the presentation with an overview of the financial disclosure and ethics processes. She's an ethics and political law attorney who has advised many nominees from both parties throughout her career. She was a longtime colleague of Bob Rizzi uh, at Steptoe and Johnson, and she's an expert on these issues, so she'll lead it off. Charles Borden, who is a partner at Holland and Knight, will describe the disclosure process and outline the 278E form. That's the form that everyone needs to fill out for senior level positions for ethics purposes. And Charles, like Diana, is a very well respected political and law expert and has advised, like Heather and Bob, dozens and dozens, and Diana as well, of candidates on their appointment process. Third will be Heather Samuelson. She's seen the process from the inside, from the White House and the State Department, where she was the one receiving and reviewing these forms. She knew a good form and a bad form. She helped people get through the process. And she's got lots of experience vetting nominees and she'll share that experience with us today. And then Bob Rizzi, uh, who's helped us put together these seminars and who's been really you know, a leader in this space, uh, will close out the presentation to focus on tax issues. Tax issues have been a source of pain for many nominees, and Bob will tell you how to avoid those pain points. Uh, he's a partner at Steptoe and Johnson as a, and has advised many, many senior officials get through the process, and he's done vetting himself, including for vice presidential picks. So we thank you for your contribution. They're all volunteers to help on this series, and we're grateful for, for their help. So on the next slide, uh, this again is the third in our series of webinars. If you haven't seen the first two, they're on YouTube or on the Partnership for Public Service or the Center for Presidential Transition Ready to Serve page. You can just Google or search for Ready to Serve and you'll find both the slides and the recordings. 
or you can do the same on YouTube. So thanks again for joining. We'll look, please send in your questions and I'm gonna turn it over to Diana to kick us off. Thanks, Dave. So I'm gonna start a little bit by talking about the legal framework to give you some context to this larger discussion. There are two sets of rules that really govern this area. One that addresses conflicts of interest and one that addresses financial disclosure. They're related, but they're separate regimes. And there's often a little bit of confusion about which rules apply where and how they overlap. So without getting too deep into the weeds of the legal jargon uh, in this area, I just wanna give you a flavor for what the major rules are here. The primary conflict rule is that an employee is prohibited from participating personally and substantially in a particular matter if it would have a direct and predictable effect on the employee's financial interest. Now there's tons of nuance here. All of those bolded terms are terms of art that have specific definitions. But the idea is that we want our government officials to be making decisions in the best interest of the public and not in the interest of their own personal portfolio. Makes sense, pretty easy concept from that perspective. Now financial disclosure, helps inform the conflict analysis. So if we don't want people to be making decisions in their own personal interest, we have to know what their own personal financial interests are. And so the disclosure regime in part helps to inform that analysis. It also serves uh, sort of help build comp public confidence, trust in government. The public disclosures in particular give everyone kind of access to this information. So there are two sets of rules here, but they interplay pretty nicely. There's a little bit of you know, conflict and difference between the two. There are some standards that are slightly different on both sides, but they're two separate things. Next slide, please. So I wanna give you a sense of where this all falls in the larger vetting process. So this timeline is really nicely lays out kind of the general flow of the steps. And you'll see that financial disclosure typically comes after the background investigation. So once you fill out that massive form that we talked about uh, at length in webinar two, you're gonna move on to financial disclosure. We'll talk about the different types of disclosure in a, in a second, but most folks are filling out form 278E, which is the public disclosure. You'll get that form, you'll be given access um, by either the administration or the transition team or whatever government entity you're working with. And you sit down, you take on the monumental task of filling this whole thing out. You then submit it to the government and they use it to do a conflicts review. And Heather is gonna discuss this in greater detail, but essentially the agency is looking at the duties of the role that you're being considered for and comparing that with your financial interests. And they're trying to anticipate whether any potential conflicts of interest will exist. They will provide you with a draft ethics agreement, which outlines the conflicts that they see and how you're gonna remedy those conflicts, whether you're gonna divest the asset, whether you're gonna recuse from the matter, et cetera. And then there's some negotiation of the ethics agreement. There is some room to have a discussion with them. Um, you know, maybe someone else in the department can take on the duties that are uh, presenting the conflict. Maybe there's a different way to resolve, um, to resolve the issue they've got in mind. And all of that typically happens before a public announcement is made about your appointment or your nomination. So it's a critical last step in getting you to that, um, to that finish line. Next slide, please. I wanna to briefly touch on the players that are involved in the process. A lot of it is you know, acronyms thrown around that folks that aren't in the government yet um, might not be familiar with, but you will soon enough. So every agency in the executive branch has a DAO, which is a designated agency ethics official. And this is the lead individual who is responsible for uh, ethics reviews and conflict of interest reviews for that agency. They're typically supported by a number of ethics attorneys, depending on the size of the agency. 
And these are the folks that you're going to interact with who are going to determine um, whether a conflict exists uh, and really help you navigate those rules. White House Counsel's Office and PPO are also involved in the review. Uh, depending on the seniority of the position, their level of involvement will, will kind of come into play there, but there are um, designated ethics attorneys in White House Counsel's Office that all they do is review these types of documents and work with folks through uh, the nominations process and uh, ethics matters while they're in government. Private advisors are another one that folks are often surprised to hear are involved in this process. But this is going to be kind of your team of helpers um, to help you fill these forms out. It's going to be your accountant. It's going to be your financial advisors. It's going to be uh, your tax preparer, um, a trust lawyer, perhaps if you have family trusts. And oftentimes, folks who have you know, maybe complex financial assets or a unique situation will hire a private lawyer who is experienced in this process to help them navigate. And that can be a really beneficial tool. Um, having someone who knows, uh, knows all the twists and turns and has done this before can be really helpful if you have kind of a sticky situation. So when you're thinking about how do I prepare for this, think about all of these folks. Who are you gonna need to help you with this? Um, you know, your accountants, your CPA is just reach out to those folks if you need them while you're working through this process. And lastly, I wanted to highlight OGE, the Office of Government Ethics. They are uh, the agency that oversees the executive branch ethics program. So they make the rules in this area, they administer the financial disclosure process, and they review a lot of the ethics agreements across the agencies. They are sort of the source of truth for ethics guidance and advice in this area. Um, and the DAOs will uh, often consult them for ethics advice with respect to your ethics agreement and, and various issues. So they're an important player uh, to this whole process as well. Next slide, please. So quickly, I just want to highlight that there are different types of financial disclosure, and it's important to understand which box you fit into before you kind of tackle this process. There is public financial disclosure, which is Form 278E, and what we're going to talk in detail about later on. There's also confidential financial disclosure, uh, which is Form 450. And whether you are a 278E or a 450 depends on the position that you're going into. Both of those forms are annual, and so you'll re-up it every year that you're in the government. While you're in the government, you will do continued financial disclosure. In addition to those annual updates, you will also do periodic transaction reporting uh, if you're in the public disclosure um, side of the house. Those are Form 278T. And there are other parts of this whole vetting process that require financial disclosure. Many of the Senate committee questionnaires require it. And so just be aware that you're going to have to do this in multiple places and you want to be really careful to be consistent across the board. There are different requirements for each form, but keep a close eye on making sure that what you're reporting um, is the same as what you've reported in other places. And I also just wanted to note that what we're talking about here today is executive branch financial disclosure. There are similar but slightly different regimes for exec, uh, legislative and judicial branch employees. And so that hopefully that helps set the stage for the next topics that we're going to discuss. I wanted to just give you a flavor of the sort of environment that all of this exists in. We're going to dive deeper into disclosure, specifically the public form 278E. And then Heather's going to help us walk through the conflict analysis process. And we're going to finish up with a discussion of um, special issues and some of the tricky tax topics that come up. So with that, I will turn it over. Oh, integrity. One more slide. We're also going to just want to highlight this is the online system where you file your Form 278E. It's so nice now. It's all online in like a, a very automated system. Um, you'll get your login credentials from the government, whether it's from the transition team or um, White House PPO when you're starting out this process. And then you can log in and add things in as you go. Um, you can save your work and come back to it later. You can also grant access 
to some of your private advisors to help input and review, which can be a really nice tool if you've got um, a financial advisor or an accountant who can kind of look over your work. Um, so this is what the, the login screen looks like and you'll get more information about that as you get through the process. All right, with that, I will turn it over to Charles. Uh, thank you, Diana. Um, <clears throat> next slide. So I'm going to uh, briefly review the financial disclosure uh, rules. Um, and before I jump into the uh, form 278E, the form that Diana was just talking about, I just want to cover a couple of key points that you should keep in mind when you're thinking about financial disclosure generally. Um, first, uh, financial disclosure rules principally focus on three types of financial disclosure. You're going to be disclosing the assets you hold, you're going to be disclosing your sources of income. You're going to be disclosing your professional relationships, both you know, the positions you hold in various organizations, as well as, depending on your business, uh, potentially certain client relationships. Uh, second key point to keep in mind, as Diana said, what sort of financial disclosure you're going to need to make is going to vary depending on your position. Uh, folks who are PAS or are going into very senior positions are going to be filing the 278E. That's what we're going to focus on today. But uh, most uh, political appointees actually are going to be filing the Form 450, the Confidential Financial Disclosure Form. These forms are very similar. A lot of the information you're providing is very similar, but there are some um, important differences, and I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. Uh, third, to echo what Diana was saying, um, financial disclosure is an ongoing obligation that exists throughout your entire time in government. So you, this is not something that you simply do when you go into government and then it stops. You will have annual financial uh, disclosure filings that you need to make. You'll need to make a termination report when you leave government. Uh, the important thing I think to keep in mind here is that each of these filings is slightly different. They have slightly different requirements. They cover slightly different timeframes. And so just the takeaway for, for, for the moment is if you're interested in serving, understand that the 278E and as a new entrant is a start of the process. And this is gonna be something you're gonna have to think about for your entire time in government service. Lastly, when we're talking about financial disclosure here, uh, we're talking not just about financial disclosure for you who's going into government, but we're also talking about it uh, with respect to your spouse and to your dependent children. You're going to need to disclose information about their assets uh, and income as well as your own. Uh, next slide. So I'm now going to provide a very high level overview of the Form 2780 and go through each of the relevant parts and provide briefly the sort of information you're going to need to disclose in those particular sections. Uh, one of the key issues to, to you know, keep in mind when you're filling out a, a Form 278E is you should be clear on which parts you need to fill out. Again, which parts you need to fill out is going to vary depending on what category of filer you are. Um, and two, you need to be very clear on the reporting period because the reporting periods for each part um, are different and uh, you need to make sure you understand what time periods you have to cover when you're filling out your form. Uh, I'm going to run through the requirements for a new entrant because that's the focus of this webinar series, someone who's looking to go into government. And that means I'm not going to discuss part seven of the form, which covers transactions, or part nine of the form, which covers gifts and travel, because new entrants don't need to fill out those, those parts. Let's take it from the top. Part one, filers positions held outside of US government. Basically in this section, you're gonna to need to disclose all of the positions that you hold or used to hold um, during the current year or the preceding two years. So if you're filing this form in 2020, you're talking about information for 2018, 2019, 2020. These are any positions you hold, compensated, not compensated, basically in any organization. So certainly, you, know, you need to disclose information regarding positions you hold uh, in your employment capacity, but also if you serve on the boards of nonprofit organizations, you serve uh, on a family trust, a family foundation, all of that needs to be disclosed in part one as well. Part two, filers, employment, assets, and income and retirement accounts. Basically in this section, you need to disclose your assets and your income and your retirement accounts that are associated with your current employment. So you're going to be disclosing assets that are connected to your current employer. If you have stock in a company you work for, you would disclose that here. You disclose your compensation, your salary, your bonus. You disclose your retirement accounts that are associated with your current employer, like a 401k. And what you're gonna be disclosing here are the value of those assets, as well as the income that those assets have generated, assuming they're above certain de minimis levels. 
Uh, one important thing to keep in mind when it comes to income, you are required to basically disclose the actual income you've received from your uh, earned income you've received from your, your employer during the, the reporting period. So, you know, if you are filling out this form um, and you're filling out today, you're going to need to disclose the actual precise amount of salary compensation that you've received from your employer for 2019 and 2020. Part three, filers, employment agreement and arrangements. Uh, this part of the, the form requires you to basically lay out uh, agreements uh, or arrangements you have regarding retirement, pension, health benefits with current or former employers at the time you're filling out the form. So these are things like deferred compensation arrangements, severance packages, 401ks, and You'll, you'll note that there's, there could be some overlap here. You can end up disclosing some of this information both in part two and in part three of the form. The reason that happens is because you're, you're, you're touching on different issues. In part two, you're identifying an asset and providing information about valuation and income. In part three, you're basically just describing the arrangement. And oftentimes, if you're talking about you know, some sort of uh, retirement benefit or severance package or, or other sort of deferred compensation arrangement, the, the descriptions in part three can be quite complicated um, uh, and somewhat bespoke. Part four, filer sources of compensation exceeding $5,000 in a year. In this section, the filer needs to, to identify any party that has paid more than $5,000 in a calendar year uh, for the filer services for the current year and the two preceding years. So again, if you're filling out this this form right now in 2020, you would be making this, this report for 2020, for 2019, for 2018. This covers payments made for your services that go to either you or to your employer. So for example, if you're a lawyer who works for a law firm, um, if you've done 5, 000, more than $5,000 worth of work for a particular client in a calendar year, um, the fact that your law firm uh, would receive that payment, not you, does not change the fact that you still need to disclose that information. On this, uh, on this part of the form. Uh, this has historically been an area of, uh, of significant um, uh, complexity for people who work in law firms or lobbying shops or traditional client related industries, but we've seen in, in recent years a sort of an expansion of the definition of client and other uh, industries that work in an advisory capacity like financial services are increasingly needing to think about whether or not their client relationships need to be reported um, in this part as well. Uh, part five, spouses, employment assets and income and retirement accounts. Uh, essentially, this is the same disclosure you're making in part two, except you're doing it for your spouse rather than yourself. You basically are making an identical disclosure with a couple of, of, of minor uh, tweaks. The most significant one is you do not need to provide precise compensation or information for your spouse. So I was saying before, for you in part two, you're going to need to disclose exactly how much your employer has paid you in salary and compensation for the reporting period. In the case of your spouse, you're just going to need to note the fact that your spouse was compensated by that source, the fact of compensation. You don't need to provide the precise information. Part six of the form, other assets and income. Basically, this require, is the part where you disclose all other assets and income that you or your spouse or your dependent children have that weren't reported in parts two and parts five. Um, and this is, you know, is, is going to, to cover uh, the current year and the prior calendar year. So again, if you're filling out today, 2020 and 2019, you need to basically report assets above a de minimis value above, you know, that, that are worth more than $1,000 and income that is uh, uh, sources that, are, that have produced more than $200 of income during the reporting period. One thing to note here, because it comes up a lot, you need to report uh, things like capital gains that are generated by, the, by virtue of selling certain assets, even though you no longer hold the assets in question. So for example, if you sell some stock during the reporting period, it generates more than $200 uh, in, in income. You will still need to disclose that information on your report. You'll still need to disclose the stock and the income source, even though you no longer hold the asset in question. Charles, Finally. this is Dave. I'm sorry, to, I just want to encourage you to move along a little because we have a bunch of slides to go through. Absolutely, Dave. Uh, finally, uh, part eight, liabilities. You need, uh, you know, in this section, you need to, to cover um, 
basically any liabilities of more than $10,000 that you, uh, your spouse or your dependent uh, child had during the current calendar year or the prior calendar year. Uh, you know, there's limited exceptions here. The, the question that usually comes up here is, do you need to disclose a mortgage on your, on your home? The answer to that is if you're a presidential appointee, no. If you're a PAS, unfortunately, due to some recent changes in the law, yes, you do. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to, you know, that was a very, very quick overview. There are a lot of issues we can discuss further, and I'm conscious of the time, so I'm not going to get into lots of details of, of other financial reporting challenges. Just one thing to note here, and I think this is, this is really the important takeaway. Um, the financial disclosure rules really assume that you have a pretty simple portfolio, and if you do, it should be relatively straightforward. So, you know, you hold stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you have bank accounts. If you have a more complex portfolio, this can get much more, more difficult. One thing to note is historically it was very challenging to uh, report things like alternative investments, holdings in private equity funds or hedge funds or, or uh, interests of that sort. Uh, it's much easier now. Um, and that's in part because OGE has, has uh, changed its guidance with respect to such assets. And increasingly you can disclose them the same way you would disclose a mutual fund. So rather while well, in the past you might have had to get into to, to underlying holdings of such, uh, entities disclose you know, all the portfolio companies held by a private equity fund. And now you can basically disclose it on an aggregate basis the same way you would like a, a Vanguard mutual fund. Next slide. Uh, lastly, I just want to touch very quickly on, on the 450 and on the 278T that Diana mentioned. Again, most political appointees, particularly if you're, you know, again, folks who are not going into Senate confirmed positions, you're going to be filling out the 450. Basically, you're going to be disclosing the same sort of information that I just went through for the 278E. Couple of important differences. The most significant one is uh, for, you are not gonna need to provide assets, a specific asset and income information. You're gonna have to disclose, you know, the assets you hold, you're gonna have to disclose the sources of income, you're not gonna have to disclose any valuation information if you're filling out the form 450. You also don't need to disclose certain types of financial holdings that don't tend to raise conflict issues, things like bank accounts or diversified mutual funds. Uh, finally, on the, the Form 278T, as Diana said, this is sort of a, a, an obligation that comes when you're in government. Um, it's basically designed to present, prevent insider trading on political intelligence issues and it therefore requires near contemporaneous reporting of transactions on those types of instruments, things like stocks or bonds. You don't need to deal with it if you're talking about real estate transactions or uh, mutual fund transactions. Uh, I think the key takeaway here is the time frames on reporting here are quite tight. You need to, to basically disclose within 45 days of a transaction happening, regardless of whether you know about it. If you're planning to go into government and you have an active portfolio, you're planning to trade regularly, or you at least are interested in potentially trading regularly, understand that you're going to be subject to this 278T regime and have a process in place to make sure you can comply with the deadlines. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Heather to talk about conflicts. Hi everyone, so I'm gonna pick up where Diana left off on terms of the complex review process that's done with the financial disclosure form. So after you fill out the financial disclosure form that Charles walked through, if you, for all presidential appointment positions, that form will go to what's called the DAO, the Designated Agency Ethics Official at the agency that you would be going into. For most positions, this is your main point of contact on all ethics questions and in terms of the ethics and conflicts review process. If you're Senate confirmed, then your form will also be reviewed by the Office of Government Ethics, OGE, and it will also be reviewed by White House Counsel's Office. There are also some other uh, senior presidential appointments that will be reviewed by those as well. So the question is, what exactly are these folks looking at? As Diana walked through, uh, U.S. I'm sorry, 18 U.S.C. 208. It's a criminal statute that prohibits executive branch employees from participating personally, substantially in a particular matter if it would have a direct and predictable effect on the employee's financial interest. As Diana said, that can be pretty nuanced and hard to understand what exactly that means. But the goal is to make sure that decisions that you make as a senior government official are being made in the interest of the American people, not because you or your spouse or your children will financially uh, gain from it. 
And what is considered a conflict can vary heavily based on the agency and the position that you're going into. It can be based on current issues that that agency is facing or issues that the agency or the position may face. So there is an anticipatory nature about all of this. The agency DAO's role is to, take a, to look at your financial disclosure form, look at your holdings, look at any outside positions you hold, whether that's sitting on the board of a nonprofit or otherwise, as well as your spouse and your dependent children's finances and employer, and look at this, look at the position you're going into and say, where could there potentially be a conflict? So to highlight a, a hypothetical example of what this means, if you are being vetted for a position where you will have a personal substantial role in determining whether a medication is approved by the FDA and you own significant stock in that medications manufacturer, your spouse is an executive at that manufacturer, that could be considered a conflict because approving that medication to go to market could create a direct and predictable effect on your financial interests. But if you hold that stock, and your, exec, your spouse and executive at that company, but you're going to position at the State Department, for example, where you would not be making decisions that would necessarily directly affect that company, then it may not be considered a conflict. So this analysis is very much position by spe position specific and issue by issue specific. It's also important to note, as Charles said, that you will fill out these financial disclosure forms regularly but you're also going to be, um, the conflict review process is also going to be an ongoing review process. It's not a snapshot in time. So once you're in the position, you will be expected to know your financial holdings and consult with agency ethics officials since should a matter come before your desk that you think could potentially be a conflict based on your financial holdings, your spouse's employer, et cetera. Next slide. So what happens if, you, if it's determined that you do have a conflict? You turn in your financial disclosure form, the agency ethics officials review it, they review it with OGE, and they determine, yes, that you do have a conflict. What do you do? First, you can recuse yourself from any matters related to that entity. So if your, for example, your spouse is an executive at Pfizer, you own significant stock at Pfizer, you can recuse yourself from making any decisions that could have a direct and predictable effect on Pfizer. This option sometimes works very well for folks, but if you're required to recuse so often that you cannot effectively fulfill your job duties, then this option's not gonna work. The other option is to divest the asset, and that is the most common that you can divest any conflicting assets that you have to avoid a potential conflict. The third option is a waiver. Um, this is rarely granted, but there have been times when OGE or the, the DAO has granted a waiver so that you can continue to work on the matter. And the last option, which Bob is gonna talk about more, is putting your assets in a qualified or blind trust. This is the option that folks most likely ask about. Um, and in reality, it's actually hard to do in practice for reasons that Bob's gonna walk through in the next section. Um, most appointees work through the process of alleviating conflicts with the DAO, a, the agency designated ethics official. If you're in a Senate confirmed position, like I said before, you'll see OGE will be involved, White House Counsel's Office will get involved, um, and OGE will be the, the final arbiter of whether or not it, it would be a, a conflict under the legal regime. Um, once conflicts are resolved and you've gone through this process and you've had it back and forth with the DAO and you, you will be asked to sign an ethics agreement, which I think is on my next slide. The ethics agreement will lay out what steps you are agreeing to take to, to alleviate the conflict. So is that that you are divesting the asset that's concerning? Do you agree to recuse yourself? Do you agree to step down from a nonprofit board that could, that would, could potentially be a conflict? If it's a Senate confirmed role, both your financial disclosure form and your ethics agreement will go to the Senate committee that would be reviewing your nomination. And it's also important to note that these forms will also be publicly available so that members of the public, press, et cetera, would be able to access your financial disclosure form as well. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Bob, who's going to walk through some of these issues in more detail. Thanks very much, Heather. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on some special financial issues, and then uh, we would like to make sure we have time for questions. Um, almost everybody asks about blind trusts. Um, blind trusts basically are a um, commonly misperceived solution to conflicts. The reason they don't work is because when assets are transferred into the blind trust, the, the uh, presidential appointee still knows about those assets, so the blind trust is not actually uh, blind. And uh, there are just a handful of blind trusts that have been uh, used in my experience. Um, but there are other common issues that um, people do ask about, and uh, another one is spousal conflicts. Uh, even though, uh, especially um, today, many spouses have completely separate uh, assets and completely separate careers, of course, um, the government ethics rules treat them as an economic unity. And of course, that um, creates a number of, of tensions. One thing to keep in mind is that all of these rules are um, almost all of these rules are, are technical and uh, relatively bright line rules. And that is sometimes um, a concern for people. But the, the other side of the coin is that compliance with these rules serves as a shield uh, against a defense against any ethics related uh, charges, because the answer will be, I've complied with these bright line rules. I've been told by ethics officials that I'm in compliance and therefore I've done my, I've, I've uh, completed my obligation. Um, next slide, please. Another special issue um, that people will ask about is the certificate of divestiture and deferral of gain on required divestitures. Um, again, it's quite technical, um, won't go into it here, um, but it does provide some relief for people who are going into the government and are required to sell assets um, and uh, mitigate some of the uh, adverse tax consequences, requires them to reinvest the proceeds in diversified uh, mutual funds. Um, and then the um, next slide, please. Um, and this is, this is one of many tax issues that uh, come up. Tax issues permeate the entire government ethics process. Um, one area that people are commonly concerned about is disclosure of their returns and how that is handled. Most committees at least ask the nominee to, uh, to confirm that if required, they will provide their returns. Some committees actually require submitting the returns. Uh, traditionally, White House review has asked for tax return review for certain periods of time. Um, and so you can, you can sort of count on tax issues coming up. In the first session, we talked about some specific hot button issues, the famous nanny taxes, um, tax shelters, charitable deductions, those kinds of things. Um, but generally, business returns, so partnership returns, S corporation returns, um, closely held business returns are not reviewed. Personal returns are the focus. Um, and then finally, um, what to do now, how to prepare. Um, we have we have tried to focus throughout this series on how to be ready, what to uh, do in advance. And the, the, in the disclosure and conflicts area, the most important thing is just to get the information together now, um, because as as Dave said, once once you're con once you're being considered, things go very very quickly. The deadlines. Um, come out very quickly. So the more that you can do now to gather bank accounts, prepare um, a worksheet of your of your financial holdings, to gather your um, uh, uh, trust documents and that sort of thing, uh, the better. And prepare an exit plan for positions and for assets, including illiquid assets. We've put together a sort of a worksheet to give people an idea of what they're going to need to do with respect to each asset that they hold that could create a potential conflict of interest. And if you do have uh, time to do that in advance, it'll, it'll pay dividends later. And the most important thing is to be able to say 
um, to the administration or the transition uh, that you're ready to serve. Um, with that, maybe we could, uh, uh, I know we've gotten a lot of questions on the Q&A um, screen here, and I, and I know that uh, Dave has some as well. I'll try to get to those. The first question is for Heather. So you said that the uh, 278 is a public document, it's disclosed. So where does one find those if they want to look at what they look like? And isn't it a little embarrassing if all your friends see what assets you have or lack of assets? So that form is available on OGE's website. Um, you can look, you can request to view a, uh, uh, individual or presidential appointees form. Um, it's part of the process, unfortunately, <laughs> to serve in these positions as unfortunately that, that information is made public. Okay, so oh, you have to actually request the form or is it just on OGE's website? Um, my panelists might be able to correct me on this. I, my recollection is that you have to request it from OGE's website. You have to okay. sign on to OGE's website and request it from there, but they might be able to correct me on this. Okay. Yeah, you do technically request it, but it's pretty instant access. Okay. Um, I will note though that the values and the income are almost always given in ranges. So you're not giving the specific dollar value. So you have a little bit of cover um, into the true value of your assets. Okay. We have a bunch of questions that have come in. Um, let's see. If you have an LLC where you co-owned it or you're a co-owner or investor in it, and that LLC has debts or obligations, but you're not liable for those, do you have to list those? That sounds like a Rizzi question. Okay. Um, and, and the short answer is no, you do not. Um, on the uh, part eight of the 278E, there's a, a disclosure of liabilities, but it is limited to personal liabilities generally. Um, and of course, this is uh, one of the things that has come up in the um, uh, recent past where loans that were made to uh, real estate uh, LLCs were not disclosed because they were at the, at the uh, entity level rather than at the personal level um, and, you know, that, that creates uh, uh, some concerns that the disclosure is really not complete. If you personally guarantee a loan, there's a question about whether that personal guarantee would be a disclosable liability. Um, but you get into a situation where you're disclosing, for example, your American Express balance, but you're not disclosing the fact that the LLC that you own uh, owes some um, offshore bank, uh, $100 million, that seems kind of a gap in the, in the coverage, but that's the way these bright line rules basically work. Okay, we have one more for you, Bob, before you get off the hot seat. What about student loan debt? You have Personal to disclose that. Loan. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have yes. to disclose that, and, okay. Um, and mortgages, uh, there's a special rule for mortgages that uh, certain, um, categories of appointees have to disclose their own personal mortgage on their own personal property, but others are not required to do that. So, Okay, so we have a question, maybe Diana, because um, you're a young person, you'll understand this more than I do, but we have a question about cryptocurrency investments. So if you have yeah. cryptocurrency investments, do you have to disclose that? And, and how do you do that? You do. Um, so this is a new one that's, you know, the last, I don't know, five, eight years. Um, and OGE actually has given guidance on this, that cryptocurrency is reported. You do it like you would any other asset. Um, you name the type of cryptocurrency. And I believe you also have to do the name of the platform or the exchange that you own the currency on. And then the value and the income that's produced from it, um, just as you would any other asset. Okay, before you get off the hot seat, Diana, here's another question. <clears throat> what if you signed a non-disclosure agreement in the past year? And we have another question, which is what if your client's identities are confidential? How do you square the tension between- Yeah, that's a tough one. 
um, with the non-disclosure agreement, I'm not sure if the question is whether you need to disclose that in the arrangements section or if you signed an NDA that's preventing you from disclosing some other part of the form. Um, so you'd need to work that out. And I would I would talk with the DAO about the specifics of that one. Um, but with the, the second piece of your question, you the confidential clients is one that does come up. Nobody wants to disclose their clients. Um, and there is not a sort of attorney client privilege that protects the name of your clients. Uh, so that's something you're kind of gonna have to talk to your firm about and, and figure out a way to get comfortable um, disclosing that information. Okay. Dave, just if I could touch ahead, on that Charles. point, because it actually has come up, I think a fair amount recently. So. The, the OG has taken a pretty hard line on these, on these issues, but there is actually an exception if you have a contractual relationship, if your firm has a contractual relationship with the client where the disclosure of the client's name, the disclosure of the representation itself is covered. So one of the things I would suggest is figure out exactly what sort of relationships you have, what sort of NDAs your firm or your, you have entered into, and see if they cover the fact of representation rather than just the substance. Because if they do, there may be some basis for not disclosing the client relationship. Okay. Um, question for Heather. Okay, so if someone is able to self-file taxes and say they have cash and mostly mutual fund assets, do you need a private lawyer? Um, in most cases, I saw folks had private lawyers when they had complex finances. So as you're going through your finances, if you're having difficulty completing the financial disclosure form, I would recommend consulting your accountant or hiring a lawyer to help you do that. If you have pretty simple assets and you're able to easily fill out the form, it's definitely not required to have one. Okay. And most people don't. When I was Going to the government when I was 28, I had no money. I lived in a basement apartment. I was paying rent and it was pretty simple. I just filled it out. So um, maybe later in life or if you've had a lot of financial success or if you have complex financial holdings, then you need a lawyer. Okay, uh, here's a couple more for Mr. Rizzi. Please, can you give us a little more detail on an illiquid asset exit plan? How do you do that and what does the government require? This is a, um, an ongoing and very significant uh, problem um, for people going into the government. As Charles said, a lot of these rules were developed for um, at a time when people um, had quite you know, simple assets, stocks and bonds. Now people invest in um, funds of various kinds. It's very common. And there's, it's difficult to sometimes to figure out an exit. There are basically three or four different ways to exit from an illiquid asset. One is to, um, is to gift the asset to um, adult children or to other family members or to a trust for those uh, individuals. A second is to uh, transfer the asset to a uh, uh, charity, including a private foundation, uh, both of those are considered to be adequate divestitures. Um, there is now much a much more active secondary market for some types of private equity fund interests. So there's a possibility of having an outright uh, sale. In some cases, the fund is willing to redeem the interest. In other words, that the, the entity will buy back the interest from you. Uh, but generally that's done at a discount. And so there's an economic cost to doing that. Um, so, but each one of those uh, has uh, some friction because there's just not, um, there's not a way to, to do it easily. And it's something that needs to be done in advance because usually you have about 90 days after you go into the government uh, to divest. Um, and so, and sometimes these kinds of transactions can take a while to negotiate and execute. So it's something you have to plan for. Okay, before you leave, Bob, you got a few more questions. How about joint trust assets between a, your a pointy and a spouse? Well, as I mentioned, um, the um, ethics rules take uh, what we used to call sort of an Aussie and Harriet view of uh, spousal assets. Everything is considered to be uh, owned by both spouses. So. Um, 
trust assets of a spouse are attributed to the um, person going into the government. Um, trusts generally create, I think, some of, some of the biggest headaches because in a lot of cases, um, family trusts, for example, um, have um, potential conflicts. The filer, the person going into the government has a financial interest uh, through an interest in the trust, but can't require the trust to do, the, to do a divestiture. Uh, and because the trustee has got uh, fiduciary obligations to all of the other beneficiaries. So uh, trust assets generally create um, a number of concerns that uh, go beyond uh, simply identifying disclosure and, and identifying potential conflicts. So we're, we're gonna go for about 10 more minutes. We started a little late and we have a bunch of questions, so we're just gonna go over a little. All right, so here's one that I'm gonna throw at Heather since you worked in the State Department. Um, and I'm sure this came up, do foreign assets, say you have a foreign bank account, foreign real estate assets or foreign investment holdings, do they pose any special concerns? Um, I'll let my co my co-panelists talk about this more from an OG perspective. It did present some concerns from a, um, a vetting perspective, a political vetting perspective, and it would also protect, protect some concerns if you are using it as a tax shelter. Anybody else want to add anything to that? From a disclosure perspective, it's not going to, to there aren't any you know, particular issues that are going to come up in terms of, of, of disclosing that they're different from disclosing any other asset. The fact that they're a foreign asset is really, as Heather was saying, a political question. One can imagine if you have an asset in X country and you are appointed ambassador to that country, that, that you probably have to divest. Almost certainly, but it would depend on what the asset is. If it's a real estate asset, it might not. There might be ways around, around divesting in that case. I got it. Okay. So we have another question um, for Bob going back to the illiquid asset. So illiquid means illiquid. You can't sell it. So if you have 90 days and you really can't sell it, what do you do? Well, it's a problem. I mean, just to the classic example is an illiquid holding in a private equity fund that has um, conflicts because of a portfolio company that's owned by the fund. Um, and because the filer is attributed the financial interest that is uh, represented by that portfolio company, you would have a potential conflict. And so if you go into the government and you can't uh, sell it or, or in some cases can't sell it within 90 days, it's possible to get a longer period of time to divest. But during that period, you have a potential conflict and therefore you have to recuse yourself from any particular matter that could affect that financial interest and that could adversely affect your ability to do your job. And so, um, so as I say, these illiquid holdings uh, are an area that create the most concern, at least in, in our experience, the most concern with people going into the government, um, even if they're relatively small investments, uh, they, they really can um, create an impediment. Um, we've had some clients that have had to literally just walk away from uh, these holdings in order to serve, and it's been uh, financially quite painful. Um, Charles, we have a question that says that, let's say you have, uh, you own an apartment and you have a roommate there and that roommate pays you rent. Do you need to disclose that rental income under part four? Uh, you wouldn't need to disclose it under part four, but you would, would disclose it under part six as, as essentially another, another asset or, or, or income. And yes, it, you know, if you have, uh, any sort of, of property, real estate interest that you are using to generate some form of income, even if it's, you know, renting out, you know, use having a roommate or one of the things you'd see in DC a lot, and Dave, you just alluded to it earlier, people rent out a basement apartment or things like that in their house. You will need to disclose, you know, the fact that you, you know, the, the value of your home and the fact that you're generating rent, rental income from that on, on part six of the form. Okay, and Charles, while you're on the hot seat, we have a question about the disclosure requirements for a real estate trust. Um, I mean, you know, the real the question would be whether or not there you could get the real estate 
um, trust to sort of qualify as, uh, you know, NEIF or essentially the equivalent under uh, the disclosure rules. Um, you know, to the extent you could, then you would basically disclose it the same way that you would disclose other types of, of sort of pooled investment uh, vehicles. You would basically just disclose you know, the value of your holding in the REIT and the income you've generated from the REIT. Um, if you can't fit it into that category, then you would be, uh, you know, required basically to disclose the underlying holdings of the REIT. But assuming you're talking about a publicly traded REIT, uh, my, you're going to be disclosing it the same way that you would disclose, uh, you know, a mutual fund holding. Okay, we have a question for maybe Bob and Heather. So Bob, you've advised some people with big pain points and their confirmations and Heather, you have vetted people. And so there's a question that says there was a blog post on the Center for Presidential Transition about how not to get a job in an administration, how to blow it. And so can you give us your perspective on some of the biggest mistakes people have made in the disclosure process? Not disclosing. <laughs> um, <laughs> failure to disclose is the biggest mistake you can make in this process, um, both from the vetting side uh, when you're when you're being vetted by White House Counsel's Office, as well as on the financial disclosure form. It is if it's discovered that you have assets that were not disclosed during those processes, that will be the biggest mistake. Okay, Bob, you've seen it all. What's what are other mistakes? Um, well, I, I think uh, they fall into that category. I mean, this, um, this disclosure regime is without a doubt the most elaborate of any um, country in the world that we have in, in the United States. And it requires an incredible level of detail. And, and frankly, people just sometimes forget about uh, some holding that they have, some 401k plan that they uh, that they got as a result of, an, of a job 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, and they just, and they just uh, don't keep track of it. I mean, we had, a, we had an example of somebody who was going into a very senior position in the government um, that involved uh, you know, one, of the, one of the financial offices in the government and uh, forgot that he had a bank account that had a million dollars in it. So, um, <laughs> Fortunately, that was caught before he did his filing. But, you know, those are the kinds of things that can happen. And it just requires scrubbing and scrubbing to make sure you've picked up everything. Because the problem is that if you discover something later um, that you forgot when you did your filing, and it turns, and you're in the government, and it turns out that you made a uh, decision when you were in the government that affected that financial interest, it's too late at that point, really. Uh, to do anything about it, uh, and it's a very that's a very dangerous situation to be in because the um, the statute we're talking about here is a criminal statute. So it it pays to spend a bit of time and think about where you know the the figurative uh, you know mutual fund under the mattress kind of a situation. We should we should uh, make sure you ask all the right questions uh, and and try to make sure you don't miss anything. Okay, so Rizzi, lesson number one is if you have a bank account with a million dollars and you forget about it, that's not a good thing. Okay, so <laughs> um, maybe for Diana, just do a couple more questions. Question about conflicts of interest imputed to a spouse. So let's say that you are taking a job in the administration and let's say your spouse has a law firm job or a representational job where they have income, where it's related to the work that you're going to do at that agency. What do you do? That's a good question. You know, with a spouse, they don't have the same client reporting regime as you would if you yourself was a partner at a law firm. Um, but that income from the law firm will be reported on your financial disclosure and could present a conflict of interest. That one alone is likely not going to create a conflict because it's with the firm and not the doesn't drill down into the clients of that firm. Um, but you could see sort of a PR problem there um, that you'd want to take into consideration. There's a lot of tough issues with spouses with this one. Um, 
that you just kind of have to work through and take on a case by case basis. So, but your designated ethics official may require you to recuse yourself from a particular matter where your spouse is actively working on that matter, correct? Yes, okay. that's true. Um, okay, here's another good one. If you have received money or gifts from a foreign government, is that a problem? I mean, I, I think, it, again, there, there's sort of a question of, it was a problem from a disclosure perspective, um, and then it's a problem from a conflict perspective. On the disclosure perspective, uh, I mean, there's no specific rules about disclosing foreign gifts. You may have certain things in, in things like committee questionnaires um, or other things like that that would address that. From a conflict perspective, I defer to, to Heather. I mean, you can think of a lot of situations where you might have received income from a foreign government, and it's fine. You're, you know, you're a again, you're you work at a law firm and you're defending, you know, a state-owned enterprise and you know commercial litigation in in the Southern District of New York. I mean, that's not going to be the kind of thing that's going to cause a lot of of issues. But obviously, if you take, you know, you have other types of of of, of financial relationships with with foreign government entities those could be very concerning. Okay, so I have one final question, which I'm gonna to throw to Heather, which is, you've seen it all. You've been in the White House, you've vetted candidates, you've been in the State Department, you've vetted candidates. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you started your job so you could have advised people how to avoid problems? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, what I always advise people is to Think hard as you're filling out these forms. Look at the forms early. Think hard as you're filling them out. What are things that could come up that could be potentially embarrassing to myself, to the administration? What is sort of worst case scenario? <laughs> and make sure that you are very open with the vetting attorneys in the White House, uh, with, with White House liaisons, with PPO who call you, to make sure that you can you're, you're comfortable discussing it and comfortable kind of walking through how you would describe it if it, it became public. Um, and really, it, this process that we've just been going through now, it's not a game of gotcha. It really is to make sure that you are able to effectively serve in your role in the government. You are not tripping over criminal statutes, that you are able to get through a Senate confirmation process. So I, I would always advise people, review all your forms, make sure everything is accurate and consistent, and make sure that you are um, you know, being as open as possible throughout the process. Sage advice. All right, I've, I can't control myself. So one last question for Rizzi, which is, I'm sure you've had a lot of clients, I've seen this, where they say OGE or the designated ethics officer is picking on me. They don't like me, they're being unfair, and they're treating me poorly. Why do I have to sell this asset? So what do you advise your clients when they think that a particular agency ethics official is picking on them? Well, um, that has happened. Um, and uh, my experience um, with OGE and um, with the agency DAOs that I've been dealing with uh, has been uniformly that they are um, uh, professional uh, and are trying to um, and trying to administer these bright line rules uh, uniformly. Um, and uh, so the, and, and the answer is that we're all, we all have a common interest in getting through these issues and reaching a, um, reaching a solution because it protects everybody. So, so my um, uh, message to the clients is we're going to have to work through these because once we get a resolution, once OGE and the DAO are comfortable, then that becomes a shield uh, for any claims that are made later. The danger here is not the ethics officials. The danger is that an ethics issue will become politicized, weaponized um, in the you know, highly partisan world that we live in. And that somebody will say that so and so has a 
you know, conflict of interest or is, is somehow, you know, violating the ethics rules. And to be able to hold up an ethics agreement and say, look, we, we disclosed all of this, we resolved all of this, and the ethics officials signed off on it um, is, is uh, extremely useful to be able to do. Um, the, the part of the problem is, I mean, I know this is maybe a little more um, than you're asking, but part of the problem here is that the ethics rules, government ethics rules are in many ways different from anything anybody has seen in the, in the outside world. And uh, so they're just not used to these rules. And the process of going through disclosure and a conflicts analysis is a little bit of a socialization exercise. It's getting people used to uh, making the transition from the private sector where it's buyer beware and where, you know, there obviously are disclosure issues, but, but it's, not, it's not nearly at the same level. It's getting people used to going into this new environment where the rules are different because the, the as, as Diana said at the beginning, the, the goal here is to make sure that people are serving the public. And so uh, dealing with ethics officials, yes, it can be, it can be frustrating sometimes. I, believe me, I can, I can relate to that. Um, but ultimately, uh, it, will, it will protect the, um, the uh, nominee. Just to give you an example, we had somebody who went into the government, wonderful uh, nominee, came from a big bank, um, and, and had to go through all kinds of um, filters and, and hurdles to get into the government. And there was a story that came up in the paper that accused him of something. Um, and his answer was, uh, or the, the news story said his answer was, um, I reviewed all of this at the government Office of Government Ethics and they signed off on it. It was a less than 24 hour story, it went away. Uh, because of the work that he had done. So uh, that I think is the, is the payoff uh, at the end of the day here. Well, Bob Rizzi, Diana Mullis, Heather Samuelson, Charles Borden, thank you for sharing your time, your wisdom, your expertise on all three of these sessions. Bob and Charles have written a ethics vetting guide, which you can see on the partnerships website, the Center for Presidential Transition website. Uh, let me also thank Jill Highland, Libby Logan's Woods, and also Carter Hershorn for their help in putting these together. And uh, I hope that these have been valuable and I hope that um, you listen to the other two if you haven't listened to them already. So thank you very much and uh, thanks for your time to all the panelists.